Celeste Ng's 2017 novel Little Fires Everywhere tells the story of two worlds that collide in the Cleveland, Ohio suburb of Shaker Heights. The real-life town of Shaker touts itself as America's first fully planned community, a slice of egalitarian utopia where proper plans and regulations create a framework for a perfect life, at least for those who choose to fit themselves into this framework. Lifelong Shakerite Elena Richardson has carefully confined her life and her family to the outlines drawn by Shaker, and, at least in her mind, all is well, until the arrival of new tenant Mia Warren and her daughter Pearl in the Richardson family's rental duplex. Little Fires Everywhere is a story about the suburbs, about motherhood, love, racism, sex, lies, chaos, the plans we make, the walls we build, and the bubbles we live in whether by choice or by circumstance. Most of all, it's a story about empathy and how the bubbles we inhabit insulate us from empathizing with others. The 2020 Hulu series, written for television by Liz Tegelar and produced by co-stars Reese Witherspoon and Kerry Washington, uses the same framework to tell a different story. Though the two versions start and end in essentially the same place, the showrunners make a lot of dramatic but purposeful changes that reshape the story into one of isolation. Both stories are ultimately effective, and I'd like to look at why. Why did the showrunners make the changes they made? Why did they tweak or drastically alter nearly every character? Why and how did they take Celeste Ng's story and retell it with a twist? My name is Charlie, and this is page to screen. The novel and the show both start with a fire. Suburban matriarch Elena Richardson stands outside her burning home, arms crossed in her bathrobe, with three of her four children behind her on the street. The youngest, Izzy, is nowhere to be found. In the book, we see Mrs. Richardson's thoughts, her panic as she checks her children's rooms amidst the blaring of alarms, and the little fires started in each of their beds, spreading out of control. Mrs. Richardson knows instinctually that Izzy lit these fires and fumes on the sidewalk, wondering what she might do when Izzy turns up. In the TV series, we don't see these thoughts, but we do hear the little fires described to Elena and her husband Bill by investigators who ask where Izzy might be. We return from the fire to the summer of 1997, four months before the fire in the show and nearly a full year in the book, and from here, things diverge. Mia and Pearl arrive in Shaker Heights, but find the rental duplex on Winslow Place only after they are ushered out of the parking lot they slept in by a police officer, called in, unbeknownst to the Warrens, by Elena, a scene not present in the book. Mia is more outwardly standoffish towards Elena than her book counterpart, and by the end of the first episode, it's clear that her relationship with Pearl is more tense and confrontational as well. In another added scene, Pearl and the sensitive third Richardson child Moody are caught trespassing in a junkyard, and Mia is furious with her daughter in a way we never see in the books. To book readers, this departure might be jarring, and it was to me too, but it is purposeful. A book can have a slow build-up towards a single climax, but an eight-episode TV series needs seven smaller conflicts and seven smaller climaxes before the grand finale. Heightened conflict between the Warrens is often used for that purpose in the show, but it serves another purpose as well. Mia holds secrets. Secrets that are central to the larger plot. Secrets that the book can drip-feed through her thoughts and through the suspicions of others. The show needs to, well, show that Mia has secrets and that she feels life as she knows it depends on laying low. At first, these changes to the characters can feel like empty melodrama, especially to those familiar with the source material, but they ultimately help the show build its own version of Ng's story. Now, just as a heads up, from here we're going to get further into spoiler territory for both the show and the book, and if you've only read the book or only seen the show, they are different enough that there are things that will surprise you when you check out the other, so if you're interested in experiencing both unspoiled, Stop the video, bookmark it, go watch or go read, and come back later, because from here on out, spoiler territory, everything goes. Now, as the show carries on, it departs further from the book. A homecoming dance becomes the setting of some events from the book's Halloween party, though the party still occurs. High school senior Lexi Richardson appropriates a story from sophomore Pearl about rejection from a higher-level math class for her Yale application, rather than convincing Pearl to just write the essay for her, as in the book. 
Pearl and Junior Trip Richardson's clandestine hookups start out rockier than in the novel, but still elevate to the same secret, guiltful romance. In the books, these are all sparks that don't really come together and connect into a wildfire until the very end. The show, however, heightens the drama much earlier. Izzy Richardson struggles with her sexuality and becomes a more present, pervasive undercurrent rather than the largely forgotten background actor she is for most of the novel. The book's only real confrontation between Elena and Mia comes at the end, but in the show, Elena discovers that Mia revealed baby Mei Ling's location to Bibi Chow much earlier, leading to a dramatic split between the Richardson and Warren families in only the fourth episode. This split, while again feeling melodramatic at first, is actually a pretty clever way to start emphasizing the show's theme of isolation, but we'll come back to that. Like I said earlier, the book Little Fires Everywhere is ultimately about empathy, and how the comfort of our personal bubbles can restrict it. There's an inherent sociopathy to suburbia, and if you've ever lived in a place like Shaker Heights, you've probably experienced it. Relating to struggles you've never witnessed, much less experienced, is hard, and you can see this in Elena Richardson, who, in the book, lives her whole life within the plan laid out by Shaker, but chosen by her. She made a choice not to run away with her high school boyfriend, to attend a nearby small private college, to return to her childhood home, and to live her entire life safe inside that bubble. So, when presented with a worldview that challenges her own, with a life that doesn't fit her plan in the slightest, with the struggles of immigrant Bibi Chow, Mrs. Richardson fails totally to empathize. She thinks to herself, what would I do in Bibi's position, fighting for my child, the child I gave up in my darkest moment in an attempt to save that child's life, and concludes, simply, that she would never be in that position in the first place. If empathy is the conscious act of putting yourself in another person's shoes, deciding only that you would never wear those shoes is not empathy. Elena Richardson is so sheltered, so insulated from reality, that she can't imagine a life unlike her own. On some level, that's a circumstance of her birth, but she's also an adult, responsible for her own decisions in the same way as Bibi Chow. Her children may choose to break out of their bubble, but Mrs. Richardson, until the bitter end, chose to stay. And that's not to say that the more empathic Mia Warren is necessarily perfect or right. Her experience and travels have given her a broader perspective, and she's certainly a kinder, more understanding person than Elena. Still, right or wrong, her support of Bibi Chow is shaped by her own experiences and by the unique circumstances of Pearl's birth. Really, the whole book is crafted to show us that, right or wrong, our empathy is shaped by our own experiences. The show emphasizes a different side of the story. The heightened conflict between Elena and Mia and the change to Izzy's backstory, which paints her as an unwanted baby rather than just a difficult one, raises the stakes early. Elena finds herself digging into Mia's history aggressively and with malicious intent, hoping to undermine Mia as a character witness for Bibi. Ultimately, it's Elena who tells Pearl about her origins and her mother's flight from the Ryans. Lena presents this as Mia's shameful secret, the reason they've had to move constantly and live life practically on the run. On some level, Elena's right. From her Shaker Heights high horse, she sees this as a rough, vagabond life that robs Pearl of advantages she could have had in a wealthy household. Yet again, in Elena's lack of empathy, she fails to see the story from Mia's perspective. And Mia's story, as the show tells it, is one of loneliness. A story of parents who would not support her artistry or even make an effort to understand it. Of losing the only people who ever did understand. Her brother Warren and her mentor in, in the show's canon lover, Pauline Hawthorne. A story where her art and her daughter are the only things that have ever truly been hers. Mia's secrets, which are necessary to keep her daughter, isolate her from the empathy and understanding of others. How can anyone truly know Mia Warren without knowing that she's really Mia Wright, that she's lived the last 15 years on the run from the family she was supposed to be a surrogate for, or that the only two people who ever truly did know her are dead and gone? Elena's actions are evil and wrong, and odds are she would have viewed Mia's story with disdain and judgment no matter how it was discovered. Still, the show and its changes pose the question, what if Mia had been able to write her own story? What if she could tell things from her perspective? Would people react differently? 
and we can look to the book for the answer. Yes, people absolutely would. Pearl, when told of her origins by Mia instead of Elena, is shocked and upset, but understanding. Mia's own daughter is obviously a favorable example, though, and in the end, the walls that separate Mia and Elena would probably remain, no matter how things are framed. Mia Warren's walls are different from Elena Richardson's. They come from two endlessly different, eternally juxtaposed backgrounds. Yet, in the show, both women find themselves isolated by the walls they've built. Mia's secrets breed resentment from her daughter, just as Elena's narcissism drives away her husband and children. Elena still fails to empathize, though, and is ultimately left totally alone, trying to fit her children into the boxes she laid out for them, driving all four to pour the gas that burns down the Richardson house. There's so much more I could say about this adaptation, like how the Elena of the show is a monster that Reese Witherspoon sells fantastically, or how I felt Izzy's added character development frankly improved on the book, though the book was still stronger overall. The important thing, though, is this. The showrunners took Celeste Ng's story and made it their own. It's different, dramatically so, but it's still very good, and it succeeds because it does what all great adaptations do take a deep understanding of the original work and its themes and retell the story in a way that shines a light on the themes that spoke to you. Do that and you'll have two great experiences, each their own little world, each their own little spark. <laughs>